Welcome back to our podcast on Solid Ground. My name is Joe Boyle, and I'm the social media specialist here at Helicon. I'm joined with our CEO, Jay Silver, as well as Andy Powell from Alcatech. So Andy, can you tell us a little, little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, Joe. Uh, first of all, thanks you and Jay, and thanks Helicon for having having me here to do the, uh, the podcast. I appreciate that. So I uh, my background is construction. I started my first uh, construction work uh, 12 years old. That's what happens when your dad's a a contractor. So <laughs> I became a master of the broom and the uh, shovel and, yeah. uh, and excelled at those. And then I uh, continued on uh, doing construction work. And then after, after college, I uh, worked in the concrete pipe and precast industry. Uh, about the last five years of that uh, part of my career, I was doing you know, polyurethane and epoxy injection on everything from lift stations to sewer pipes, uh, water treatment plants, things like that. So I actually so working with you know the polyurethanes that I didn't realize I would be selling at some point, and then about ten and a half years ago, um, Alchemy Polymers was formed uh, by Steve Barden, who happened to be my best friend, and he knew from my background of working with machines, working with chemicals, being in sales, uh, being a hands-on guy, I might be a good fit to start with a company. So my first, uh, you know, when we started there, we had four people. So I've done every job just about at the uh, company from batching material to driving forklifts to invoicing to cold calls to, you know, sales and technical field support. And uh, then slowly as our company's grown, you know, thanks to good partners like Helicon, we've, uh, you know, we've gone from like four people to close to 40 people. And now I'm the current division manager of the geotech and the lease seal divisions for the company. Wow. Very nice. So to get right into it, uh, can you explain the common causes of concrete settlement and sinking and how chemical grout addresses these issues? Yeah. So, so concrete slabs, you know, I can do a whole hour, you know, presentation on why, <laughs> why does concrete settle and, you know, what are the options when it does? So you're going to find water is the first, you know, primary culprit, usually erosion, you know, it's pretty easy to drive through either a residential or a commercial property and, see how they've got their downspouts uh, oriented and you're like, okay, I guarantee you there's voids under that concrete or it's settling. We got a downspout coming out right next to a slab is inevitable. You're going to get water washing under that and then things sinking. Um, after that, you're going to look at, you know, could be buried, you know, trash or mm -hmm. organic debris that's uh, decomposing over time. Uh, a lot of times they clear property to, you know, build houses or build buildings and, contractors are supposed to dispose of, you know, tree trunks and debris and garbage and, you know, pieces of wood that, you know, are trimmed off when they do the carpentry. And instead, a lot of times it gets either burned or, or dug in a hole, put, put in a hole. And then five years later, you got your pool out there and then it starts settling and sinking and you get an engineer to find out what's going on and they start augering out all kinds of trash and organic debris. So, so that's a, definitely a culprit, you know, buried, buried, buried stuff. Um, then there's going to be natural organics that are in the soil sometimes that you don't know about, and they are breaking down over time. And maybe a geotechnical report didn't find that, you know, before the project was initiated. So you get settlement, you know, that occurs. Uh, then there's also uh, just poor compaction, you know, just people not compacting like you're supposed to. Seems like the closer you get up to a structure, the worse, you know, the compaction gets. I know y'all don't have a lot of basements here in Florida, but nope. say up in Georgia where we have, you know, hills and we got basements, when they pour the basement walls, they're going to dig outside of that area where they put the forms and they call that the over dig. So you now got this area of soil after they pour the concrete, pull the forms out and there's this gap. And then it's not that easy to compact that soil in that area of the over dig or they just trying to get it done. And then they put these big front steps right on there going up to the house and then they start settling and if you come and probe around you'll find that okay mm -hmm. there's some bad compaction here especially up against you know structures you'll see things sinking towards the house towards the building oftentimes uh, because of that but those are primary reasons uh, but water is your main culprit there is freeze and thaw reasons but that's not an issue down here in florida yeah right so for those who aren't aware can you describe the process of concrete lifting and leveling in more detail yeah, so, I mean, I think everybody's seen, you know, concrete slab that's down in a, in a tripping hazard. So what our contractors do is um, they use a polyurethane foam, 
So it's a two component system. So you have an A side chemical that's called isocyanate, and then you have a B side chemical, which is what we make. And that B side is where all the magic occurs. You know, polyurethane can be anything from, you know, spray foam. It can be a Nerf football. It could be mm -hmm. your couch cushions, your seat cushions. Mm -hmm. It's uh, insulation in your in your uh, house, your roof, insulation for your appliances. And then there's geotechnical polymers, and that's what we're we're talking about. So what happens is when these A and B chemicals come together is they react and they expand and they make a polyurethane foam. And there's all different kinds of densities, and usually the geotechnical foams are high density. They're going to be foams that you could grab with your hand and you can't, you can't crush them. You can't even indent those. And so you use um, you know, a proportioner pump or a reactor type pump that takes the A and the B chemicals and heats them up, equalizes the viscosities, pumps them at high pressure through some high pressure lines, and then they meet in what's called an impingement gun. And that's where the size of your hoses pinches down to a really, really small diameter in that gun, builds up a lot of pressure. The A and the B chemical hit each other at a high velocity, is expelled out of the gun underneath the slab through a hole and through a port, and it starts reacting quickly within just two to three seconds. And as it does, there's two different catalysts. One's a gelling catalyst and one's a blowing catalyst. And the gelling catalyst is holding everything together. And then the blowing catalyst is going to create that, that oomph, that lift that occurs. And so you could imagine this is a product expanding in a confined area underneath concrete, and it will start to pick it up. And some people, you know, they don't believe it. I've been on jobs where they're mm -hmm. saying, there's no way you can pick up this heavy 12-inch thick slab with, with, with foam. It's just not, not going to happen. But actually, if you do the math and you take, uh, you know, 144 square inches in a you know, square foot and you start thinking about what does a cubic foot of concrete weigh, say it's 150 pounds, if I start applying like 2 PSI underneath that one square foot, I've got more pressure across there than what that 12 inch thick piece of concrete weighs. So with just a few PSI, we can actually start lifting concrete and we do it in a very controlled method. The guys are injecting, they're moving around at a different pattern and you know, hitting where the low spots are and using dial indicators and zip levels to monitor it as it slowly comes up and then always paying attention you know, to what's going around. We don't wanna overlift anything and we don't wanna slab lifting behind us or we don't want the wrong slab lifting. So there's a lot of, you know, observation uh, and a lot of monitoring with instruments to see what's going on. And then a lot of it's just uh, common sense about where to start and, you know, where to finish. So that's hopefully that wraps uh, or explains it in what's a nutshell. The, what's the yeah. general strength of the material? How many pounds will it support? Is it 10,000, 14,000 pounds? Or what's the PSI strength yeah, of so, the material? Yeah. So if you think about what soil compaction requirement is to pour a new slab or a footing, it's going to be usually 2,000 to 2,500 pounds per square foot. So they'll say PSF. So typically our lifting foam started about 7,000 PSF, and that's considered a free rise, you know, strength. So that means if I was to react, you know, this three pound density polyurethane foam, you know, you know, one cubic foot box, and I have that block, it can support 7,000 pounds that block could. Now imagine it being in a confined space, you know, under a slab, it's usually gonna be two or three times that density. So even though the data sheet's gonna say it's a 7,000 PSF, once it's in place and it's lifted concrete, it's probably closer to over 20,000 PSF. So 10 times the compaction mm -hmm. yeah. requirements for the soil. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you mentioned, uh, Andy, organics in the soil, and that that is definitely a problem here in Florida with contractors mm -hmm. back in the 50s, 60s, backfilling, uh, sometimes it's just natural. Uh, other times uh, a homeowner will remove a large oak tree close to the foundation of their home. Five years later down the road, that stump that they tried to ground out, ground grind out as well as possible starts to decay and they get some settlement in that corner. Um, you know, we're talking about lifting slabs. Uh, what about the product? Is it able to treat or encapsulate or, or how does it um, remediate those organic uh, soil conditions uh, down in that probably 10 to probably two, two foot uh, range of soil? Right, right. So, so organics are a big problem, you know, here in Florida, peat and other types of what they call yeah. muck. You know, mm -hmm. you talk to the engineers and they say, we got to demuck, you know, this side. Well, sometimes 
you know, that's not convenient. There's already a structure there and organics are causing, you know, the problem. So what polyurethane will do is it won't permeate organics, but it will squeeze organics. And, 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 and when you, when you do um, two component poly in the soil, you're actually creating, you know, lenses that, that spread out like a pancake. And then as you're, and then as it's lensing in different areas, it's expanding and squeezing. And so you're starting to squeeze the airspace and the moisture out of the organics. Um, we've done road projects where we had huge grid patterns where we're injecting the, the product and all of a sudden you see the moisture and the water actually start mm. pushing up out of the next drill holes uh. that we haven't even injected yet. So we're trying to squeeze that oxygen and, and moisture out of the soil. Um, and we have projects that, you know, 10 years that we've had in service now in Florida, houses broken in half, sinking, inorganic soil i remember we did the vice president of skanska we did we did his house i think my co-worker colt was actually on that project it was down in orlando the guy was despondent he was like man we're gonna have to i'm gonna have to give the keys back to the bank they just told me my my repair is going to be a half a million dollars to put helicals in under my entire house inside and out and our team went in there with or a contractor went in there with polyurethane and lifted both ends of the house back up three inches, put it back together, has never moved again. You know, that was probably like eight years ago. So we know from job history that it that it works and at the very least could buy you a lot of time. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I know we can never promise lift only stopping settlement, but can we guarantee a concrete slab will stay the same or can it sink again? So I think that's a two two part question. Um, some of it falls onto the you know, the person that goes out there first and evaluates what's going on. Like if they come out and they're like, okay, this slab's down, you know, three inches, I'm gonna do a quick calculation. And, and, and they're not looking for maybe what's the root cause of the problem. So that site evaluation, which is something that we, you know, as part of our training, we teach not just how to do it, but we teach the sales team. We teach the people that are going out doing site evaluations so that they know what to look for so that you don't get those callbacks. So, so two things could happen. One, you missed something. You, you saw the slab was down. You didn't take a soil probe and probe around and find, oh, it's bad soil all the way down. I bury my, my probe down five feet deep. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I don't catch that in the first time, I can lift that concrete back up and my polyurethane foam is not going to shrink or de de degrade. And then it could settle back down because the problem is five feet deep. So that's a case of being missed, you know, up front. The other way it happens is, you know, the issues causing the settlement, maybe it's this, maybe it's the, the roof drain coming off the building. And, you, and that's why you need to put that in your contract. Like, hey, and, and why your salesperson needs to say, I'm gonna, you know, we'll lift this up, but I can't, I can't back up my warranty if you don't do something about that roof drain. Because over time, that water coming off your roof is a lot of gallons. You know, every time it rains, it's washing back against the, the concrete. It's washing up against my polyurethane foam. Now, it's not going to wash it out, but eventually it's going to start going underneath it, just like it did going under the slab, and it's going to start making that void, and you're going to start getting the settlement again. So, so it's two things. One, you need to find out what's the root cause at the beginning and catch that and then do the right remedy. And then secondly, uh, if there's obvious reasons that a slab sinking, you know, primarily roof drains and things like that, you need to address that with the property owner. Right. And is there a typical life expectancy, life expectancy to this polyurethane foam or is it like, how long does it last you think? Yeah, we, we get that question. You know, we, we've been doing projects for DOTs and energy companies that want to know that they're like, they're like this, energy facilities got to last, you know, 40 years, you know, can, how long is your polyurethane going to, going to hold up? So it was originally, you know, polyurethane used for concrete lifting, uh, was originally done like in 1982. So it's not that new of a, you know, of a product and application in around 1987, they patented it for doing deep soil stabilization. And this was over in Finland. And so, that technology has eventually spread across, you know, more than 50 nations. Every DOT uh, in the country um, is doing or has people to do two-component polyurethane underneath their slabs. So 
the first DOTs to test it were up in the Midwest, and these were in the 90s, and they wanted to use them for bridge approach, slab lifting, and also shoulders uh, on the interstate system. And they tested them in service for eight or nine years before they approved it. So they were like, okay, we're going to let you try it. Here's a test project. And once it was approved, I think it was Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, places like that. So it was a pretty harsh, cold environment, freeze-thaw cycles. It showed to hold up over eight years, and they approved it as a method for you know lifting and stabilizing roadways. So that was in the 90s, and now every DOT's done it. And the uh, you know when you go to the lab and you talk to the people who develop polyurethane, um, 50 to 100 years is the expected service life of it. And some accelerated aging testing shows out to 300 years. So when you think about, you know, this is not styrofoam. This is polyurethane foam. It's highly chemical resistant. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't absorb, you know, moisture or chemicals because it's a closed cell structure. It's derived from the same kinds of base family chemicals as like plastics. And so everybody knows, like if you talk about the giant, you know, square miles of plastic floating in the ocean that just won't break down, you know, in the sun and the salt water all day, you know, polyurethanes are made from those same very tough base chemicals. So hard to break it down. Mm-hmm. And probably underneath the ground is is good conditions to protect it versus out swirling around in the ocean in those kind of environments. That's right. Um, you know, they say the UV light uh, breaks down the polyurethane, but I've done I've done testing by having polyurethane uh, you know, overshot onto the bumper of my truck. And it's five years now, and I cannot get it off. And it's been in cold, freezing, sun every day. It's not parked in a garage. I cannot get it off the bumper. So it's extremely tough. Wow. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So in what situations can chemical grout be applied? Well, shoot. Um, you know, I just recently put together a presentation. I wanted to have a presentation that kind of mirrored what an engineer website looks like. When you go to an engineering website, it's uh, they're going to a lot of times highlight the markets that they work in. Like, okay, we, we do aviation, you know, infrastructure, you know, wastewater, energy, you know, you know, higher education, historical buildings. So they'll have all these market segments. And so I started putting one together. I'm like, I want my presentation that shows all our market segments. And then I started going through it and I was like, holy cow, you know, we've got like between 20 to 30 different market segments that we use, you know, two component polyurethane foam for soil stabilization, filling voids and lifting concrete. So everything from your basic ADA compliance, which is tripping hazards on sidewalks and and slabs all the way to, you know, lifting five feet thick slabs under railroads, you know, in China, you know, we've done the, the full scope. So around a residence, which I know Helicon does a lot of residential work. So here in the Florida market, you're looking at you know, your lanai's, your your patios, your pool decks, your sidewalks. Um, for soil stabilization, we can do under your under your footings, under the corners of your houses. We can support under your under your pool at times, depending on, you know, the situation. So just I mean, interior slabs. Sometimes you get mm-hmm. interior slabs that are sinking and settling and can be lifted back up. Sometimes you have a a, a, a peering job or a helical job where you may not want to go inside the inside of the property and cut huge holes to lift the interior load bearing mm-hmm. slabs. And so you do polyurethane on the inside and then you're doing the helicals piers on the outside. So doing them in conjunction um, with each other, but it's, it's really anywhere there's a void, anywhere there's a sinking piece of concrete mm-hmm. that's, that's flat. Yeah. Um, plumbing washouts from plumbing pipes and waters. Actually, that's yeah. I, one of the, one of the points that I missed earlier when you asked what causes things t- to sink is, Broken and leaking mm-hmm. pipes. Right. So yeah. thanks for <laughs> no problem closing that circle. I was like <clears throat> one of my key points, <clears throat> but I forgot it. That's all right. <clears throat> so um, how long does this injection process usually take and how much does it cost? And is it more cost effective compared to other methods? So the um, the, the time that it takes obviously is depends on the size of the the project. And you never want to jinx yourself when you pull up <laughs> and you're like, oh, all right, this one looks like a piece of cake. Uh <laughs> All our contractors would be like, oh, God, please don't say that. Well, now we're going to be here all day. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's like putting a puzzle back together. There may be a lot of different pieces of concrete that have settled 
in different ways. Yeah, I mean, it would be great if they all settled, you know, just perfectly, but sometimes they settle and they twist. I've seen concrete in other parts of the country where they have expansive clay, where the concrete actually shifts to the side, oh, and wow. that presents some interesting uh, challenges. So, you know, most you know good residential contractors can knock out you know a couple projects in a day. So I would say average project, you know, four hours, you know, to do to do your concrete lifting. There's some there's some prep work, you know, there's the actual lifting work, and then there's some cleanup and sometimes cosmetic work, whether it's fixing, uh, you know, the, the really small drill holes, you know, for injecting the slab, or maybe you want to caulk the joints or seal cracks or things like that. But I would say typically on a residential project, you know, two a day, although um, in training scenarios where you have it lined up and the logistics allow, I've done as many as four or five jobs in one day, you know, just depends on, you know, how they go and also the logistics in terms of how far you have to drive from one one project to the next and also where you live like when i did five in one day i was in a small town right and there was no traffic and everything was like five minutes from each other if we're yeah. in atlanta you're going to go and count for an hour <laughs> at least between you know getting from one job to the next so a little harder to do there yeah definitely mm -hmm. yeah in general to to piggyback on that what uh helicon is seeing um yeah some of the jobs are are half day full day a lot of it depends on the area that you're treating. Are you just doing slab injections only, or are you doing soil injections where there is no concrete that you have to core through to get your pipe in? But in, in general, um, we're pumping approximately probably 500 to 1,000 pounds per day. Uh, but there's so many different, different factors. But it is a, a very fast process. Most of the projects in general are half a day to a week, I would say, uh, one to five days in general. Um, but of course, there are your larger commercial projects that we're on for uh, upwards of months at a time. So, it, uh, but for the home residential side, uh, I'd say typically about a half a day to three days is your your big bulk of the projects. Very non-invasive. We're we're in and out. Very minimal disruption um, to the homeowner's way of life. Um, and uh, yeah, in and out yeah. compared yeah. to. Uh, you know, we may talk with to Andy on alternative methods of of uh, ripping out and replacement um, would be a good one to to touch on, and the different uh, factors of not only just cost involved in that, uh, but the time involved, and if it's a business, the impact or business interruption that that can cause, whether it's in a uh, warehouse facility. Um, we've done this product. Uh, you know, a lot of homeowners that we work with, we, we put this product underneath the slabs at NASA inside of their payload hanger uh, to support the concrete slab. So we joke around with homeowners, if it's good enough for NASA, it's got to be good enough for your driveway or your pool patio or your, your slabs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I think uh, that might segue. I think we have one of the topics we did want to touch on was what are the what are the other options, options. you know, for the a property owner when they see they have, yep. you know, a slab that's down. So uh, certainly, uh, certainly you can tear it out, which is, you know, a lot of times it's perfectly good concrete and ripping it out is going to be costly. It's going to be time consuming. It's going to be messy. You're going to have a lot of other collateral damage to your property because there's probably going to be heavier equipment and noise and dust. And, and then uh, unfortunately, a lot of that concrete that gets torn out instead of being taken and recycled, it might go into a landfill or it might be dumped down a abandoned cul-de-sac. Uh, having worked in the stormwater world, I found chunks of concrete down in st stormwater and sewer pipes where they just dump them. And, you know, so it's not really the greenest initiative to, you know, rip out and replace concrete. You know, cement industry is, I think, number two in terms of uh, CO2 emissions in the world as far as an industry. So now you're like, I mean, I'm not the biggest tree hugger in the world, but I like the environment. And there is, is an environmental statement that we can make that we're not, you know, you're not having to produce more cement. You're, you're saving, you know, perfectly good, you know, good concrete that only settled because of, you know, compaction or erosion or something like that. Um, other, other methods include uh, cementitious methods like pressure grouting, mud jacking, they call it. Mm. Super messy. Um, nobody can tell me what's in the, what's in the formula. You know, it's a little of this, a little of that. It's some soil. It's a little 
uh, sand, there's a little crushed limestone, is, is there maybe a coffee can full of cement they throw in there to work as a binder, going to put bigger holes through the concrete to lift it. Now they know what they're doing. They put the holes in the right spot. They'll lift the slab back up and it'll be looking good. Um, you can't park on it for a couple of days because it has to cure, you know, it's a concrete based material. But then over time, that material's weak and in exposure to the elements, it washes away and just disappears. The slab settles. Then they call Helicon to come out there. You're putting your three eighths inch hole through their one inch hole and lifting it back up. There's no, there's no mud jacking material under the slab at that point. So, you know, so it's, it works, but it doesn't last. Um, when this started catching on with poly in the, in the U.S., there's a lot of people mud jacking, and they're a fraction of what it used to be because people recognize, you know, that this is a, it's a lighter weight product. It's a longer lasting product. This is a much cooler product, frankly. Make way better YouTube videos, lifting, mm -hmm. yeah. lifting slabs quickly with, with polyurethane as opposed to uh, the cement. And it's also lightweight. So compared to a cementitious product, might be 100 to 150 pounds a cubic foot, putting, on, putting it under there on already suspect soil. And now instead you can have a lightweight polymer that, that gets the job done. And then unfortunately there's the, the last option is not do anything, you know, and you know, I can speak for a whole hour. I do presentations for uh, BOMA, uh, IFMA, you know, these big facility management building owners, you know, associations. And I know what the cost is of a, a tripping hazard lawsuit. So if you have more than a quarter inch down or a quarter inch or more down on your slab, it doesn't matter if it's a residence or it's a business, you're not ADA compliant. So you're thinking, oh, it's just my sidewalk. Well, what if your neighbor mm -hmm. comes over and trips on your sidewalk? They can sue you. And what if it's the sidewalk running in front of your house, the sidewalk that the county or the city put in? A lot of people think they're not responsible for that. Oh, that's the county sidewalk. May not necessarily be the case. It may actually be your liability to maintain the concrete that runs adjacent to your property. And the law will show that that's actually mostly the case. So take, for example, in uh, Philadelphia, which is a big city up north, if you have ice, say you got a, you're downtown, you got a business that's got sidewalks in front of it and is covered with ice, you have to go out there and get that ice off of there as a business owner, because if someone falls and slips out there, it's on you. It's not on the county, not on the city. They'll sue you. And I can tell you from um, looking for actual cases to, to, to give in my presentation, you know, say you go and Google, I want to Google, you know, tripping hazard lawsuit or someone gets hurt, you know, in a tripping, you know, situation, you have to go through like 20 or 30 pages of lawyers before you can actually get to a news story talking about where someone fell and got hurt, you know, and, and cause it's, they're looking for that, um, you know, slip, trip and fall, you know, Walmart gets tens of thousands of lawsuits every year, you know, they're not easy to prosecute, you know, but, there's a lot of people that would like to sue, and and also it's an it's an eyesore, you know, when your concrete's not level, um, it's dangerous. You don't want somebody to get hurt. I've seen people get hurt tripping on concrete and completely face plant like an elderly person. I saw it happen right in front of me. Uh, we were at a hotel in Jacksonville, and they did a fire drill in the middle of the night, like three o'clock in the morning. I couldn't believe it. We're in a resort. So we're all piling out, having to go out the fire doors and stuff. And this elderly lady in front of me, face plants right on. I mean, it was horrible. And I look down, and there's a tripping hazard. Oh, wow. And I look over, and there's a roof drain. And it's like, man, for a 1000 bucks, you could have had somebody come and lift this concrete back up. And now you're going to get your rear end sued off, and mm -hmm. you got no case at all. And so mm -hmm. I would say if you don't do anything, is actually the most expensive alternative okay and speaking to uh to mud jacking as as technology has evolved over the years um the chemical grouting and polyurethane process is just far superior to mud jacking mm -hmm. and that's part of the reason why you don't see very many if any mud jacking companies uh around any for any longer um we can think of countless uh times andy where we've been called out after probably five, six years after mud jacking was done. One recently was a warehouse facility 
They came in, did the mud jacking. It held for about five years, but you have to understand all of that weight that's put underneath doing the mud jacking. The soil beneath that was never treated, um, so that, that weight just slowly compacted the soil underneath it. It also does nothing to treat any of the organic uh, conditions that, that Andy was mentioning. And this particular warehouse that had the mud jacking probably five or six years ago, we were called out. Um, it was due to organics was what was causing uh, the issue. Um, so over time, that, that concrete settled onto the organics and it continued to settle. And we came back out um, or we came out, treated it with the two-part uh, chemical polyurethane grout. And it's been think about three three years now and not a settlement not an issue whatsoever on this warehouse facility that had previous mud jacking done Interesting. yeah one thing i i forgot to mention is traffic ready you know our product is traffic ready and you know it's 90 percent strength in 15 minutes is traffic ready in 45 minutes so we talk about minimal disruption you know take like an amazon warehouse we've done several up in atlanta with contractors where you know, that aisle being down in a warehouse, they're losing money. You know, we, we can't pick product out of that aisle when it's when it's down mm -hmm. and these slabs get messed up and the forklifts can't run down these slabs because they uh, they lean and they won't track the wire. And then when the operator goes up in the basket, he'll actually hit the racking because they got like an inch on each side of the forklift. Every square inch is important. And we'll come in there. Uh, and I say we, but it's like car contractors, but I'm, I'm there. So I feel like it's we, so I go in there and we, uh, we lift these slabs back up with the racking on there with all the product on the shelf, get it level. By the time we pull off, the forklift is running down. So minimal downtime, minimal disruption. You know, mm -hmm. I know on the earlier podcast, uh, that Colt talks about working at a big Marina project where, um, doing it while there's no shut down, you know, of the marina. Mm -hmm. I mean, our technology is all about, you know, not tearing out and replacing, no excavation, you know, getting into tight spaces, no extra collateral damage to the property, really small holes going through your slabs. You can't even generally tell, yeah. you know, that yeah. our teams were there. So that's that's what makes it, it makes it so cool. Yeah, exactly. Checks off all the, the main boxes of, uh, you know, for contractors, it's, uh, it's speed, cost and quality all in three um, that's right. so you're yeah. you're able to get which is very rare in construction you can usually get two of those but you can't get all three a lot of times um, but yeah it's an incredible product and we use it in as andy was mentioning in so many different industries and, and applications interesting <clears throat> so what are some preventive measures that homeowners can take to minimize the need for concrete lifting and leveling in the future so i mean probably already kind of touched on that um maintaining you know your grade on your property mm -hmm. so you know that causes you know slabs to sink to improper site drainage whether it's from your downspouts of just blows me away sometimes that i that i see houses that don't have gutters on them in places where it rains you know like crazy i've seen some in tampa plenty plenty in downtown you know parts of you know the inner inner parts of tampa where some of the older houses are and you see you know homes with no gutters, and if anybody's lived in Tampa in the summer, they know at about three o'clock it's going to rain about three inches. You know, most of the time, yep. and uh, and so all that rain, you know, is going somewhere and it's undermining you, whether it's your house or your your slabs around your house. So you know, site drainage, water management, um, you know, checking your you know checking your water bill too. I, my water bill looks you know out of whack. Maybe you got a broken pipe. That's not good. Broken pipe, putting water out, is going to erode soil. I've seen whole houses taken out because they didn't address, you know, either either pipe like water supply pipes or like or you know, like their 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 waste pipes. You know, so you know the cast iron or their PVCs, a broken joint. Every time they do their laundry, every time they're flush the toilet, you know, using water. People use so much water in the United States. We don't even <laughs> have any idea how good we have it, how much water we use. And that stuff's just flushing out under the house and undermining things. So just paying attention, um, looking for, you know, weird, you know, places where it's damp all the time around your house. Well, I sent rained in, you know, a week, but why is this area is so damp? You know, just paying attention primarily. So that's what I would say. All right, cool. 
So we've recently heard there was a relationship between termites and chemical grout. So why do some, why do some polyfoam projects require termite treatment prior to the work being done? And have you heard anything about this? I don't know why they would require, you know, termite treatment. This probably comes up since uh, my 10 and a half years doing this. It's probably come up about three times where somebody said, hey, we need a, a termite. You know, we need to know if this stuff is going to resist termites and, you know, but nobody's come to me with a case that said these termites came in and just really just got all in my polyurethane foam. So termites don't recognize, you know, polyurethane foam as a food source, but they do recognize wood as a food source. And that's why they eat the wood and burrow into it is they're eating it. And so, but it doesn't give them any nutritional value doing the polyurethane. There's no moisture in it to get either. So I just, until they come to me with cases that's like, wow, we got a million cases that, uh, you know, all these polyurethane jobs or termites are getting into it, then, then we're not, we haven't had to do anything about that. And, and usually it just, you know, the two or three times it's ever come up, it's just gone away because they don't, they don't ever come to us with these problems. I have talked to our, our chemist and our owner about it over the years because the two times it's come up and basically we were told, listen, until they show us is a it's an issue, we're not going to change anything. However, it would not be hard to add a termite inhibitor into a polyurethane resin without it affecting, mm -hmm. you know, the physical properties of it. So if it becomes something, you know, in the future that we'd have to address, it's not hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, I found it odd on just like you mentioned, a very small handful of our sinkhole repair um, insurance claim work the engineer would want us to pre-treat around the foundation of the home before injecting the, the polyurethane. Never made much um, sense to me, um, but it was an easy, low-cost uh, process that we just went along with uh, to do. But, uh, but yeah, I don't see the product as uh, uh, termites uh, using it as a food source. Uh, if anything, it would repel them. <clears throat> right. So what sets Alcatex foam apart from the competitors? Why is it the best in the business? So, you know, if there were bad, you know, polyurethane, you know, suppliers in the industry, it would be bad for the industry as a whole. So we have tough competitors. We have good, good competitors. Uh, I think most of them make really good, you know, really good products. Um, if I had to say what makes, makes ours the best, the, the fact that we, we don't use any recyclable content in, in our polyurethane. So um, we know how to. Um, we've had to do it in the past, like when COVID hit and when all the propylene oxide in the country production got shut down because of the ice storms in Texas, there was a time period where nobody could get certain chemicals and we learned how to use organic and recyclable polyols to make our, our formulations. But now we're back completely to our, our original base, you know, formulas. So we buy pure, you know, brand new virgin raw materials, um, we, we try to use the highest grade polyols and catalysts that we can use. We're not the low cost um, leader in the market. We're actually on the kind of on the other end, but it's more than, it's more than just the, you know, the polyurethane. It's, it's, it's what you get with it um, as part of our team. So, you know, we will cover you, you know, pe people like us because we, they know they can depend on the quality, but they also like the support and, you know, I, I would challenge any other company that's in our industry to line up, you know, their team against our team. You know, we've got, you know, think about people that can know how to lift concrete that's that's in our company that know how to operate y'all's equipment. You know, that includes me, it includes Colt, it includes Jacob, it includes Joel, it includes Eric, it includes Antoine, it includes Steve Taylor, it includes our owner, Steve Barton. And the training, ever, we have... So many guys that, you know, if you, you couldn't reach me, you got the next one on the speed dial to call. I'm in, I'm in a jam. I'm on a project. I need help. Um, okay, I can reach Colt. Boom, Jacob answers the phone. I can't reach Colt and Jacob. Oh, Andy's on the, on the phone. Oh, Steve Taylor's on it. Or Joel's, Joel's on it. We've got a you know, really um, strong team with a lot of field experience. And it's not just how to do it and how to troubleshoot things, but – you know, how to, how to partner with you differently. Like all the engineer presentations that we do together with Helicon to get the outreach about Helicon and about the polyurethane technology 
into the engineering community. It's a huge yeah. part, huge part of what we do. We do that for, for free and for fun. And then we also, you know, you know, estimating projects, so, you know, going to look at a project, you know, I know that many of my coworkers mm -hmm. of, you know, Steve Taylor, Colt, myself, just gone to go look at projects with Helicon. There's no guarantee we're going to get them, but, but hey, this is the one. Let's go look at it together and come up with a with a plan, and then estimating them and and selling them and and being like that third voice, you know, between you and a property owner to try to help close the deal. So we try to try to be there for all the different facets uh, to to help y'all, and of course it helps us too. So, but I would say it's more than just really good quality materials, but a really high quality uh, team. And you mentioned uh, education of engineers. Um, just for our audience, just curious, even though polyurethane and two-part chemical grounding has been around uh, for decades now, how, how often do you find engineers in the Florida um, market that possibly aren't as experienced or as knowledgeable of how they can really utilize this tool in their tool chest of different, uh, different things that they have at their disposal to fix uh, issues and problems mm -hmm. out in the out in the market. Uh, the Florida engineering community is pretty savvy. Um, mm -hmm. I think it has to do with uh, you know your proximity to several of the polyurethane manufacturers. That you know, and it, I think is uh, the sinkhole work that went down. You know, there was a lot of polyurethanes that were used for the shallow subsurface, you know, compaction. So the engineers are a little more savvy, but we still we still come across. There's so many engineers in Florida yeah. that we don't even, yeah. I never heard yeah. of that, you know, that we don't, they don't even know who they are. So it's kind of like, I don't know how many don't know it, but I'm always, uh, uh, well, I'm always surprised when we, we do go into an engineering firm and, and, and there's people that have not heard about, you know, yeah. this technology or that polyurethane could be used for lifting concrete or for soil stabilization, because there's a lot of, you know, 80 year old, people that love watching it on YouTube and think it's really cool watching the foam, you know, react and lift concrete and uh, time-lapse videos. So grandma knows about the polyurethane foam, but a lot of engineers, <laughs> you know, for some reason they, yeah. they don't. But I think the engineering community in Florida, a lot more savvy. There's some places like up in the, uh, the Northeast and the Midwest where you may have some more older school, you know, my, my grandpa Giuseppe, you know, he came over, you know, through the Staten Island, you know, back in 1880, and he was a mud jacker, and that's how we've always done it up here in Brooklyn, you know, and that's how it's always going to be, you know. So there's still some of that out yeah. there, but it's 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 going away, and uh, and yeah. the sky's the limit. Well, we're very uh, grateful, Andy, for the partnership yeah, and all that support so that you uh, that you mentioned, and and uh, same here. Excited to uh, continue yep. uh, growing together. Yeah, definitely. That wraps up our podcast. Thank you so much for watching. We want to thank Andy for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content, and we will see you next time.